Welcome back. Uh, I would like not to be heard. So, uh, so uh, we are they also welcome back those who are live streaming right now. I am going to ask the first question. I will allow myself the privilege. Uh, the question is to Dr. Vicari, but also to the rest of the panelists about communicating difficult news. Uh, because I was talking about hope, and, uh, and I emphasized how important it is supporting hopefulness, but uh, how to do it practically. And so I'd like to ask Dr. Vicari, but also um, panelists, how they would like to hear the difficult news being communicated. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and I mean, we all learn over the years how to get better at it. Um, so as a medical oncologist, when I had those moments, 30 years ago we had very few options of treatment. Nowadays we have so many options, and it's going over the option. If, if the scans come back with progressive disease and having to discuss the, the progressive disease, um, and, I mean, there are, there are different ways of saying, but let's get to the extreme when we don't have a medical answer. And first, it's so important to just spend that time with the person and their family. And that's what I said before, oncologists are, they're caring doctors. They just are in a system that they have to rush to things and sometimes don't have the tools to spend that time and sit and listen and understand that we have to be there present. So the first thing is being present, listen, listening a lot, and spending the time with the person. And the way to phrase it, if we have progressive disease, well, there, someone is on, the last medical course that we, under, that we have available is, uh, and no, no clinical trial, let's just get to the point where we exhausted all the medical answers, and the few things, the few things I say, I'm just going to say just a few, is medicine limitations are not your limitations. We people have inner healing forces, inner healing powers, where cancer cells can turn around. We talk about the different things that I discussed in integrative oncology, things that people can do. In the meantime, getting them support with the palliative care team, and if necessary, talking about hospice, as hospice is not about giving up. Hospice is a treatment modality. People live longer when they're on hospice because of the support they, they receive. So as you said, Dr. Virga, is really being talking about the truth and also everything that surrounds the truth, which is what are all the things available, palliative care, hospice, and if someone is not ready to even talk about that, is spending the time of talking about supporting the symptoms that may occur, but also spending that time to connect with those inner healing powers. And talking about resources and, and books and courses and. Uh, YouTube videos that they can watch and tune in to that ability of the body to heal, connect, have the our immune system take care of parts of the cancer cells. And so it's always giving a menu of options, being the realistic in a, a whole sense. And it really is talking about everything, but being present and listening to the person's need. And uh, supporting them and what they believe can help them heal, what they can believe help them. A lot of people are cured but never feel healed. Some people, we don't know medically how to help them come to a cure, but they feel healed. And that feeling of healing, it was what ultimately can create a potential cure. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe, maybe other. I just realized that people who are on uh, the receiving live stream may not know our panelists because we, we all have the, the names on our packages but we didn't live stream packages so maybe let's, let's, uh, let's introduce ourselves so we'll ask 
first this this um, panel to introduce yourselves, please. Hello, my name is Linda DeWitt. Good morning, Patricia Wu. Linda Johnson. And I'm Dick Club and ZB. So this is our patient panel, and this is our professional panel. So Dr. Vicari, you already met. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Caitlin. I'm here from Project Nature Food and I'm a dietitian. It's really nice to meet you and thank you for being here. Hello, my name is Tammy Hans and I am a yoga teacher at uh, Todd Cancer Center. And I'm Jennifer Sibley. I am a physical therapist, uh, lymphedema specialist here at the Todd Cancer Center. Yeah, and when I was giving Dr. Vicari a tour, Last night at uh, Todd Cassius, we were running to usually checking out the equipment. So, really, she was exercising with our equipment. Okay, uh, maybe you could uh, be so kind and tell us how you think is best, what are your experiences receiving difficult information? Hi, this is Dick do you hear me okay? No, no, no. no. So maybe here I will give you this part. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Excellent. Yes. Hello. So I'm a, I'm Dick and I'm a metastatic breast cancer patient. Uh, this August will mark 15 years from. <laughs> this journey has been easy would be a falsehood. <laughs> to say it has its ups and downs, good times and bad times, that is the truth. Um, and I've been on a variety of therapies, switching every one and a half to two years. So receiving uh, difficult news, I've had that many times going on, uh, and uh, currently as well. I'm not sure the best approach, I think a patient approach, um, uh, compassionate approach and also a, uh, a solution driven approach but giving the news and then providing what options come next and repetition is key uh, because as a patient myself and speaking to others we probably remember about 10% of what is said in a doctor visit so on the doctor's end, they may feel like they're repeating themselves endlessly and we're just not hearing, and that's probably true, but we need that repetition. Uh, in addition, I think having someone with you to have another set of ears is very useful, and uh, taking notes, and if the oncologist, or a good idea is for the oncologist to write down the important points on a piece of paper so that you can take it home and dwell on it and for the oncologist to be available to answer questions that pop up later, either via email or another visit or by phone, to have, to have those options available to us as we consider what our next steps are and the emotional and uh, social and every other impact it, it will have on us, whatever decision we make next and our current and future status. Anyone else? I'm moving into my year as a metastatic breast cancer patient, and I was originally diagnosed with late stage at the age of 30. I think one of the biggest things that I've learned about getting news is just being comfortable asking for what it is you need and maybe taking some time to think about it. I like to process things individually, so my oncologist knows that I will read things online or on paper before I meet him, and that's what works for me. If I want to cry, if I want to scream, I need to do that in private, and then when I go see my doctor, he walks in the news, he walks in the door, and whether it's good news or bad news, the first thing he says is, so what did you think? Because he knows that that's how I want to start a conversation. I also once met an oncologist about a treatment option and he told me that he was hoping to buy me more time. 
and I um, told him, you know, I need to be upfront with you. I'm very uncomfortable with hearing the phrase, buy me more time. And as we talk about this treatment, I would prefer that you refer to it as improving my quality of life. He was really stunned and taken aback, but to his credit, he never used that phrase again. So I think I would just say, you should be comfortable telling your doctors how it is you wish to hear news and what will help you process that better. I don't have a lot to add to that, but um, I was diagnosed May 2002 with metastatic breast cancer, and it'll be 15 years next month, and I'm still here. I do agree that you have to be somewhat proactive in your treatment. You have to ask questions. You have to continue to get the answers and keep asking questions till you get the answers. But it doesn't always have to come from you. You can have an advocate, you can have a buddy who can ask those questions, a mentor who's been down that. Because a lot of times, especially when you're first starting out, you don't even know what to ask. You don't understand half the questions or half the words that just fell out of your doctor's mouth and or you've obsessed about one issue. So my my best advice is when you're going to doctors and there's new stuff, pull out, pull out your phone and say, can I record you? Because you're not going to get all of it. And most of the times they will do it. My first oncologist 15 years ago recorded everything he said to me and gave me the cassette, <laughs> which I don't have anymore. <laughs> but pull out your phone and record it, and then you can go back and listen, and then you'll have question you can find out on your own through lots of googling not late at night and um, <laughs> don't obsess about it but then you will have informed questions to ask um, your doctor the next time you see it so and so from what we recommended our patients definitely it's everything that, that I would support what you said we recommend and yes, courting is very important. Having someone with you is very important. And, but also, it's important that when you go for your follow-up question, it is good to email doctor your questions ahead of time. So they, have, they will have time to reflect on your questions. And also we recommend second or third opinions. If you're diagnosed, with a metastatic, in significant change in the health status, period. We recommend the second and third opinion. That is also important. And regarding Googling, uh, it is a wonderful tool. However, even respectable websites are not written in a way to support hopefulness. So what we recommend is that you have a person who really is a hub for all information. And they are going, if people are emailing you, they will be the ones who are going to be receiving that information. And or if you are interested in something, they will be doing the Google. And then give you the succinct summary and in a way that is uh, supporting hopefully. Otherwise, we may run into a lot of unnecessary stress. So. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, everything that was said here is so important. and. A couple of things I just want to reiterate. To share with your doctor what your beliefs are, what you want to talk about, what you don't want to talk about, for them to know you and what helps you in your healing journey, and what things to avoid and words to use that will really uh, not be helpful. Number two is there are lists of up 20, 30, 40 questions that you may have and prioritize them and talk with the nurses, because the nurses so many times know more than the doctors. So ask a lot of the questions to the nurses and then save the main top questions that you didn't get answered to go over with the oncologist. As I said earlier, you deserve to spend hours with your oncologist. Unfortunately, that's not feasible. So working with the nurses and getting the wisdom from the nurses is fantastic. Thank you very much. Anybody? Alright. So 
So now we'll be collecting uh, uh, questions from you, the audience. Do we have any questions? You have questions. All right. All right. Okay. So let me try to read. Uh, okay. If you could help me read, that would be wonderful. My, my my glasses are not best reading glasses. You know. I just got them last week, you know, and that's just how, but now I realize that I'm going to be All right, awesome. So the first question is, um, what should I eat, not eat, to help my treatment work better? I would say it would depend on where you're at in the stage of your treatment. Um, because with the treatment, there are side effects. Um, there would be you know, nausea, vomiting, mucositis. It would all depend. Um, if you're going through a stage where you are in the process of wanting to maintain your weight, then we're not going to emphasize on you staying away from the hamburgers, the pizza. It's more of what you're able to tolerate. We, we do emphasize, though, that you, we want you to practice mindful eating. Be in tune with your body. Eat what you, you feel um, it makes you happy. Um, but when it, depending on what, like I said earlier, depending on where your treatment stage, and if you are um, doing well and better and no longer on treatment, um, I would say to um, the most important things is to follow the American diet, you know, American um, uh, dietary guidelines of 2015 and the um, cancer uh, guidelines, which is to really maintain your weight, uh, prevent further weight gain, um, manage your weight. Um, it's very, very crucial in that um, the extra adipose tissue, it, uh, it uh, develop estrogen. So um, in order for you to um, prevent recurrence of cancer, it's best to maintain um, a good weight, prevent weight gain, so the, the guidelines is to, you know, um, adhere to um, a low-fat diet, um, a diet that is um, plant-based, a little bit of protein, uh, not too much unprocessed food, like Dr. Berger said, um, not too much red meat, because um, there are a connection between red meat and colon cancer, um, and a lot of research out there for plant-based medicine um, because of the phytochemicals. Um, and I know in the year, past years, there's a lot of controversial around soy protein. Um, but soy is very, very healthy. Um, there was a study that was done, uh, that, that was done using genistein. And that was uh, a study done in mice. And they were fed like cups and cups, you know, 50, 80 cups or so of, of genistein. So that result shows that clients who eat soy, I mean, not clients, but mice who have, who, have, who who had a high intake of soy actually uh, developed breast cancer. But soy is actually, um, is, is, it's a weak estrogen. Um, and with the, bright, the binding receptor is different. It's, there's an alpha receptor and beta receptor, and soy protein binds to the beta receptor. So actually soy is, is very beneficial. Um, but a here to low fat diet, you know, um, to avoid high fat uh, food, anything that's fried, uh, plant-based for sure. Um, stay away from alcohol, um, limit alcohol intake, and definitely for sure stay away from tobacco smoking. The risk is very high. As far as vitamins, I would say um, what's, what's shown in large randomized studies and is safe is and multi, multivitamin, calcium, vitamin D, folate, those are safe, for sure we know. But other vitamins, like a, you know, for example, beta carotene, vitamin A, when it was done in a group of, of, of clients or patients or just individual in the communities who are smoking, they actually have a high risk of lung cancer. So since we don't have much studies on different vitamins that are in humans, we want to um, not, you know, go for the natural, uh, the food, the, the nutrients in the food itself and not rely on on vitamins as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I just also wanted to add um, 
Ask your oncologist or your cancer center if they have a nutritionist or dietitian on staff that works specifically with cancer patients. And they, be, and they can work with you to create a, a nutrition plan that's specific to your needs, your side effects, your treatment, your type of breast cancer. If that doesn't exist, one moment, I'll go to my little handy dandy reference, which is cell phone. Online, they have, there's a website for oncology registered dietitians. They're board certified, and that website is oncologynutrition.org. There's the Oncology Association of Naturopathic Physicians. There's the Society of Integrative Oncology. All these are online, and they all, in their websites, have links to local practitioners, and maybe some suggestions and how to, what questions to ask your oncologist or your cancer center to find the best nutrition and diet plan for you. If anyone else has suggestions, please add. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have next question. Is there any way to get a lazy person interpretation of PET slash CT scan, i.e. plain understandable language? Okay, so for a lay person, how to best explain the results of a PET or CT scan? Yes. Interpretation. Interpretation. Oh, uh, well, hopefully I can add. So the PET CT, PET scan is positron emission tomography. It's using, uh, it's a nuclear medicine study, it's using a radio traced sugar, so a nuclear traced sugar that goes throughout the body. When someone gets that injection of that sugar, they lie down and they sort of they sit flat and without moving for 20, 30 minutes, so that glucose can go wherever there's more activity. So normally the brain, the heart, where we should see activity. But if there are cancer cells, then these cells will pick up this radio trace sugar because they're more active. And then the radiologist can see that on a screen on the, the nuclear scan, the nuclear PET scan, they can see where it is located. And then they use the CAT scan portion to specifically point it in that area, if it's in the lung or in the bone or anywhere the, in the liver. Um, so I hope that answers. the Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. That, that was a very good explanation, if I may add it. Again, I'm a patient understanding this, so if any of this might be not exactly right, please correct me. Um, from what I understand, uh, a CAT scan shows anatomy, where the tumors are or may be, and a PET scan shows intensity, how active those cancer cells are. Although at the activity from a PET scan, some of our organs are very active anyways, so that's why you discuss it with your oncologist or the radiologist and the report says, if it's physiologically active, it means those organs naturally are very active, it doesn't mean cancer. And then other areas will be more active, it's because the cancer is more active. Um, so one, I think the CAT scan is more anatomy and the PET scan is more activity, intensity of how active the cancer cells are. Sure. That makes sense even to a psychiatrist. <laughs> yes? I don't think that was the question. I think the question was where do you get someone to help you interpret their report? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, it, it really is the, the oncologist who will be talked. The radiologists give the report and then the oncologist interpret it to the, to the person. Yes. You said it's going to be translated into English. My life is off. You said the oncologist only has so much time. Is there some paramedical? Oh, okay. Very good. So, physician assistants, for example, nurse practitioners, the nurses. In the medical team, uh, I'm just going to say, for this is a perfect question, and for anything that is related to understanding, each person, each patient should have their own team, their caregivers, their family, their friends, and those who understand. And the, the nurses, 
the physician assistant, the nurse practitioner have a lot of information and ways to explain it. Again, better than better than the doctors many times. And and always ask someone who's been through it. Like your description was perfect. So it's just spending time with others who've been through it and can articulate it from a patient perspective. Thank you very much. I'm back. Uh, one, thing to add, one thing to add, yes, I think that's a service we greatly need online and in the clinics is some kind of interpretation in layman's terms of the uh, scan results that we don't have yet. But something that, that is possible is you can ask the oncologist to uh, uh, define it for you if, if they don't have all all the time, then ask them if you can make an appointment with the radiologist to sit with them and, and go over the scan results. Some radiologists are open to speaking with patients. They're like, uh, great, sure, I never knew you wanted to talk to me. So it never hurts to ask, and that may be a possibility. But ultimately, that is the physician who ordered the test. Their responsibility is to explain the results. So, um, ask us what they, did they do. So, I think that we need to be really very important. And you, you have the power to ask for more time. There is not enough time with this visit to understand. Schedule next visit. I need more time. So, very be assertive about your needs. So, this whoever orders the test. Their responsibility is to explain it. I hope it was not so forceful. Okay. All right. So the next question is for <coughs> excuse me, Jennifer Sibley. If my swelling in my arm is mild, why is it important that I seek out lymphedema treatment? Okay. Wonderful question. Um, I'd like to also just highlight that. A lot of us that are lymphedema specialists, we most of us started out that way, um, and then in the last 10 years, there's been a real um, increase in the need for um, and awareness of the need for oncology rehab. So um, I work at a place where we're a lymphedema clinic, and I see a lot of lymphedema patients, some cancer-related, some not. Um, but we also are equipped and educated to deal with all the specific things that people go through as they're going through cancer. So there's a, a, a more of a new paradigm of thought now that as you get cancer, we hope that our medical system is first also thinking, as we break the body down with some of these treatments, how are we going to help build it back up? Um, so I wanted to really bring that in, and now that I have the mic, I want to take the opportunity just to, to say that most uh, healthcare systems have oncology rehab programs now. Um, they should if they have a cancer center. Um, if they're a center of cancer excellence, they need to have a good lymphedema program, but also the oncology rehab. So patients typically get to us through, um, uh, unfortunately, it's not always um, via the doctor initially thinking about it. A lot of times the patients have to ask. Um, because the oncologists are very um, concerned with a lot of other things. Um, and so we really want to try to empower people to know that you can ask your doctor um, if physical therapy or occupational therapy or speech therapy is appropriate for you. Um, as we get to lymphedema, there's um, we're trying to be more preventative versus reactive. And so a lot of people will have a low level of swelling, which is what the question was, um, and they say, oh, it's, it's really not that problematic. It's just a little bit of swelling. Why do I need to deal with it? And lymphedema by nature is progressive. So the lymphatic fluid is actually full of protein. Um, our lymphatic system is the, the vessels. Those are the vessels that return protein to our circulation. And so a high protein fluid that is stagnant in an area will eventually cause more damage to healthy tissue. Um, and therefore, we want to be really preventative and know that if we manage lymphedema early on, in fact, if we can catch it when it's at a stage zero, meaning there might be a backflow of lymph fluid, you might not even be swelling, you might just feel achy, that is the time that we should start seeing you. And we're trying to have more of a surveillance model where we actually are seeing people pre-surgically and then monitoring them as we go along the way post-surgically. Um, so uh, we can see if there is an onset of lymphedema or even we'll have people start wearing compression in the first year 
um, just in a more preventative fashion. So um, I do a lymphedema lecture here at the Todd Cancer Pavilion every month. Uh, it's a free lecture, 5.30, the third Wednesday of every month, and I put uh, some flyers on the tables. Um, and so that's a great opportunity to come and learn like really the specifics about the lymphatic system and then what we do. So thank you. Thank you very much. So the next question is, <clears throat> what type of yoga was specified in the study? Yeah. What type of yoga was specified in your study that you quoted? Oh, I, I, yes. uh, that, you know, I'll have to go back and look at it. I, I just can't, I can't remember right now uh, the specific, because there are different types of yoga. So that's an excellent question. And, and I'll, I'll have to go back to that study. Or when we go back to the slide uh, on the video, you can look Journal of Clinical Oncology in the month and the year, and I can't answer it. I'm sorry, I just can't recall specifically what type of yoga. But it's usually, usually, the gentle yoga that is done with cancer patients. So nothing really intense or with a high temperature. It's, it's just the regular um, low impact gentle yoga with breathing techniques and gentle movements that are done with cancer patients with cancer. Thank you very much. Exactly. I'm guessing it was probably Hatha Yoga, which is the gentlest form um, of yoga. Could you repeat the name of it? Hatha, H-A-T-H-A. -H -A. Um, it's just the most, really the most basic, gentlest form of yoga that matches movement with the breath. Um, really, that's all yoga is. It's not about headstands and nose balances. <laughs> and it's really about matching movement with breath, awareness, and accepting where we are at the moment that we come to our mats. And what I'd really like to say about yoga is, I have yet to see a student come to a class and tell me that they wish they wouldn't have come to yoga today. <laughs> Nobody ever leaves saying, I wish I wouldn't have done that. They always come and say, I'm so glad I'm here. I feel so much better. And it's for everyone. It doesn't matter if you can sit on the floor, it doesn't matter. You're not going to put your ankle behind your neck. You're just going to breathe and enjoy and connect. So, thanks. Thanks very much. Yes, please mention the class that you have. Uh, we do two classes at the Todd Cancer Center. Uh, we do one on Mondays at 10.30 to 11.30, and we do one on Wednesdays at 10 to 11. They are maxed out at 14. So there's a sign-up system, so you need to sign up usually the week ahead. And um, Randall Snyder, you can contact her via email or phone number and she can get you connected to how to sign up. You'll need a doctor's um, approval and also you'll sign a waiver to, um, to get you registered to start doing the classes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, as a patient, and thank you, Tammy, um, I've taken her class before, but I'll tell you from my side, my, from our, my perspective about yoga, yeah, you're not going to get your upside down in your head, blades behind your head and all of that. What yoga really does for that hour is makes you really concentrate on holding still and breathing. And the best part about that hour is when you get in your car and you think, I haven't thought about my cancer once. Because you you really focused. So don't go into yoga thinking, oh, I'm not in shape or not. All you have to do is just hold a pose and breathe. And everything else goes away. And that right there is invaluable sometimes because we know how we can get about what we're going through and how it goes through our minds. Having that one hour a couple of times a week is priceless. It really is that moment to have the mind just settle and not dwell or, or cycle too much is, is really uh, a comforting moment uh, or an hour. Uh, something else I wanted to bring up, and thank you both for uh, your input, um, was you can check also with your cancer center. Some of, a lot of them offer free yoga classes, 
and sometimes local yoga studios will offer the classes for free to cancer patients. All you have to do is ask. So don't, sometimes you, uh, people worry about the cost of different complementary therapies like yoga or tai chi or other modalities, but it never hurts to ask your oncologist or your cancer center or local studios that have classes if they offer either reduced cost or free classes to cancer patients. And I also recommend laughter yoga, which is actually a real thing, which is also combining laughter, conditional laughter, hopes, and laughter that doesn't require anything humorous. Because sometimes there is nothing funny in just learning that you had recurrence, but it may be very helpful to still laugh for health. And so you, there are laughter yoga classes all over at Lake County, so strongly sort of recommend it. Dr. Rickard, one of the questions in that big sack is, can you lead us through a laughing exercise? Oh, <laughs> absolutely, I can lead you into laughing exercise. <laughs> uh, you know, I teach people how to laugh, and some of you most likely were in my classes. Um, so, so laughter is a lot of valuable things. So there's huge science behind value of laughter. We call it unconditional laughter because we don't need the precondition of something funny to say. And, and a, or in the sense of humor is that I'm dependent and it depends on a lot of other things, language and so on. And, but we know that laughter stimulates 30, 27 genes that are related to the activity of natural killer cells. Those cells that give cancer, right? Laughter. And these natural killer cells are still activated four hours later after laughter. And we know that good physiological effects of laughter can last 24 hours after a good laughter. And it is not just a chuckle. <laughs> it won't do it. You need a good belly laughter, right? So, what I will ask you to do is very important. When you, when you do laughter, it's very important that you pay attention to yourself so that you have no new pain, that you make eye contact with people who laugh with you, because also laughter is the short, shortest distance between two people. We can communicate through laughter. Um, laughter is also a, is really a spiritual thing because it, it is really connecting us with who we really are and brings us to the present moment so we are really mindful and here and now and, and like in yoga, really. And after laughing session, we want to be together with our breath and catch our breath. So I will ask, I would say one to the three and we'll ask you to say, yay, all right? Okay, are you ready? Yay, yay. okay. Yay. All right, so laughter, laughter is very simple. You simply connect letter H, you know, and, uh, and with any vowel, right? So give me one vowel. Okay. Uh, oh, come on. A. <laughs> so just do. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> downstairs to you because I can see who is laughing with you. No. <laughs> the, the, the basic laughter is, so it's very simple, but you see, laughter, now laughing for health seems crazy, right? But for our ancestors 10,000 years ago, when someone would jog for health, it would be crazy. He's not chasing anything. Nothing is chasing him. Why is he run up? Right? So the same thing for us. Now we understand that, oh yes, it's healthy for you to run. But you see, we think it is crazy to laugh without any humor. No, that is not crazy, that is healthy. So we strongly recommend that you laugh um, just for health. And not pay attention that it looks crazy, because it's healthy. That's, nothing has to be humorous for you to laugh for health. You see, that is a natural laughter. Natural laughter, this is the laughter that the babies have 
They don't have sense of humor. <laughs> it is the first contact, the first conversation that we have is with our parents. When they are tickling us, they, we, as a babies, we start laughing, they laugh back to us. That is the first communication. That is the primal language and primal connection. So laugh with me, connect with me here. <laughs> And everybody is not home asleep. You woke up early and you want to go home. <laughs> silent laughter. All right? So we will be laughing silently for a moment and then we'll burst into regular laughter. So follow me. Once you get what silent laughter is, just join me. All right? <laughs> To be a normal person with a life other than a cancer patient. I find that all of the recommendations will just make cancer the, the center of my life, not just a part of it. How can I find balance? Hi. Um, my friend told me when she first had cancer, she saw it as a gift because it it introduced her to people and things that were different for her. And I said, where can I get in line to return this thing? Because I don't want it. <laughs> do I need a receipt? What, do I have to get something else? I don't know. But for me, later it has turned into somewhat of a gift because it freed me to do creative things. And that's changed who I am. And we were talking before about yoga being a place to focus. For me, creativity gives me a place to zone out and the cancer doesn't exist there. Your brain just can go away and, and be on a different plane. So I recommend that everybody do something that maybe they always wanted to do or they don't have time to do, even if it's just collage, if you cut out pretty pictures out of magazines and spend some time putting them together. If you journal, I do mosaic art, I do other things, um, and I don't think I ever would have done that before cancer. So find something that makes you feel good and do it whether you have time or not. Make time. It's important. Thank you very much. I think I chose something different, but I would say that all the effects I have are the same as what Linda just described. Um, I chose to continue to work, and that may sound a little bit a little bit surprising at first why I would say that's how I found my balance. I'm an educator. I work with schools in South LA. I work with children. And when I'm with children, children don't care if you're a cancer patient. Even when I was involved, you know, children will ask once and then they forget. And so for me, just being around kids and having a purpose is how I find my balance. And exactly as what was said before, when I'm concentrating on serving my students and my families, I'm not thinking about myself. And that's really important to have periods of the day when I'm not thinking about myself. I think uh, both Linda and Patty brought together some extremely important and valid points. 
I, I try to think about all the complementary integrative methods of better self-care, mind, body, and soul includes finding something that's fulfilling and brings you joy internally, inside, where it doesn't make you think about cancer. And all the modalities like yoga, mindful meditation, everything else you heard here, is not necessarily a cancer-specific action. It's an action for anybody out there to feel better overall. And I think it just might be more relevant for us because we're dealing with a very, very serious condition. So I, I try to not think of as dwelling on cancer, but making my quality of life as great as possible in spite of the cancer. How to make that life not be focused on the cancer because I'm feeling better, because I'm doing things that bring me joy, fulfillment. I'm doing things that make me laugh like we just did. And so create a life that has meaning and purpose and focus and brings love and support with it. Thank you very much. There is not too much to add to those words of wisdom. Uh, except that maybe, that Carl Simonton said really, um, because that is everything that, that you're saying up so uh, Finding your own path, you know, and it was said before that it is, there's no one path for everybody to be good. Uh, Sharon, I think, said that uh, at the beginning. So it's very important to remember that. But you see, Carl Simonton used to emphasize that our body can naturally identify, transform, or eliminate cancer cells from our bodies. So really strengthening this natural process. See, and that is what the father of medicine, the Hippocrates, was saying that it is really our true nature is the, the process of healing. You know, we, that happens naturally. So really, whatever strengthens our nature, so cancer or any really crisis in our lives may be helping us focus on, on us and our nature and, and discovering our true nature. How are we discovering our true nature? By doing the things that bring us joy. Because and joy is different than pleasure. Joy is in harmony with our values, it's in harmony with our biology, physiology, and, and then uh, also with our relationships and our spirituality. So that is a true, really deep joy that brings fulfillment and a sense of meaning and purpose in life. So really, it may help us live a more fulfilling life. Thank you. So the next question is, how do I approach serious dating? Serious dating. Serious dating, absolutely. Dating. <laughs> well, um, so 15 years ago, next month, I was diagnosed and I was married, but it wasn't, it wasn't a good marriage. It, it had kind of run its course. And that was really scary when I was going through treatment, realizing my marriage was not going to survive. But I was determined to survive. So seven years ago, I got married again. <laughs> so I found an amazing man who stands right next to me and faces what I face. And a lot of you here know him. He's amazing. So it's not it's not impossible, but you got to be open to it, and you got to be more open than you probably were in high school, and you have to accept the vulnerability. But they're out there, both male and female. They're out there. They want to. People want to support each other. They really do, and they want to be in a in a relationship that grows and. And is stimulating for both sides and and it is even though I'm in this for life and have been for 15 years um, there it actually opens up so much we, we talk more about really important things than I ever talked to before because it is more important now it's it's and as we grow older that's just how it is you you're able to talk more, you're able to be more intimate with those relationships. 
And that really is a gift. That really is a gift to really connect with someone on that level. So dating with cancer isn't any scarier than dating with anything else or dating in general. Put yourself out there. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> so I was diagnosed in my early 30s, and I know uh, there's probably many women out there who were diagnosed and men very young. And so it's a, the dynamic of dating, I think at any age, is probably about the same, but maybe a little harder when your peer group is not familiar with people with a cancer diagnosis. Um, I agree with Linda, it's, it's being vulnerable, taking chances, and going out anyways. There will be disappointment, there will be hurt, but then there, there is that opportunity for a great relationship. And I have to say, over the years, I, I, I've dated, and uh, many times, at least tried, and, uh, and eventually did start dating a very wonderful man who came in right as I started brand new therapy for a lung metastases and ovarian suppression, which means chemical menopause. Real plus, huh? So good people do exist, it's just taking the chance and looking for them and having frank discussions. And sometimes the question arises, when do you tell someone about your cancer diagnosis or that you're, in, you're gonna be in treatment for a very long time? or forever, or who knows. Um, I think it's really up to you. And I remember thinking back that, you know, the first few dates, I didn't really know if I wanted to continue those dates. I'm talking about previous relationships or, or dating. So you play it by ear. Sometimes you may not want to try that second or third date with that new person, and maybe there's no point in telling them. But it's up to you. You can tell them right off. You can wait. You can do whatever feels comfortable to you. And uh, there is no right or wrong, it's more or less taking that chance and going out there. And I also have to say, sometimes issues that the other person has seem so much more <laughs> scary than what you're going through. So, cancer is not the be-all, end-all of relationships, it's just part of of what happens in life to people. And, and there are good people out there who just accept it as part of life and you continue and you try to find things that the values and interests you have in common that you can make a life together with. So the next question is, can metastasis disappear or do the cells only become inactive? Yeah, it's a great question. So these cells go, when they disappear, they go through natural cell death, which is called apoptosis. So our normal cells go through natural cell death, and cancer cells go through natural cell death. So once with the treatment, uh, the cells go away, tumors disappear on the scans, and markers disappear, everything normalizes. We understand that basically our immune system got rid of the last few cells that were left. So these cells disappear, go into, they break down and break down in different chemicals that our body releases, just like it releases uh, any other cell. Great question. Thank you very much. So the next question, how do we find reliable expert professionals in the different integrated medical modalities like exercise, yoga, acupuncture, massage, nutrition? mindful meditation, botanical supplements? That's a great question, so I want you to answer that. Um, we, I, I showed some of the website, we mentioned some of the web Society for Integrative Oncology, looking at that book, Integrative Oncology. Uh, the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, AIHM, is also a very good resource. Um, and going to integrative oncology centers that are very respected, like UCLA, uh, UCSF, the ones that I mentioned on the slides, and connecting with people like here. Many of you have amazing resources, so now I'm gonna ask you to please share your resources, uh, because there are, you always wanna get to reliable, integrous websites and Facebook pages, and you wanna talk to people like, 
those are here, the presenters here, the presenters here, um, and um, one more thing I, I wanted to say, there's, because there's so much information, and you want to be with the people that you trust and, and make you feel good and will help you feel empowered. So whatever you read out of these places, just pick what makes you feel good and set aside what you just don't like or enjoy. Uh, but there are many resources out there. I just mentioned a few and I would like, please, for you to share. So you put it right back on me. <laughs> no, no, I think every... My handy dandy. Without my cell phone, I don't know where my brain would be. Um, maybe smarter. Um, so I mentioned earlier some websites that I've found that help with finding professionals that can help with a people's specific cancer situation. One was the Society of Integrative Oncology, which you mentioned as well. Oncology Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Uh, and then there's um, oncology registered dietitians. They have it's they have a, spe a certification as a specialist in oncology nutrition. Um, each of these have their own websites. Um, the Society of Integrative Oncology's website is Integrative Onc. That's O N C dot O R G, and it'll be. If you go to the Coleman Los Angeles site, they will have a list of resources listed there, so you don't have to worry about remembering all of this. Um, don't call. So if if you're, yeah, I I've been sharing my resources with the Coleman Los Angeles affiliate, and they've listed them as well on their website, and you can access that site directly. It's free and easy to navigate. And if you have any questions from that site, if you can't find something, if what you're looking for is not on the site, feel free to contact the affiliate by email or Facebook or Twitter or by phone and ask them for that resource and uh, uh, we and they will do our best to find it for you. Um, through, my, through my journey, I've worked with a lot of different practitioners, um, acupuncture, massage, um, etc. And one of the things is I really view meeting each person as a bit of an interview. And so I will call ahead and I will ask if the practitioner can make time for a conversation or a phone call before we start any type of treatment or consultation. I will ask them um, to share with me any, um, I'll ask them to share with me if they worked with cancer patients and what that experience has been like. For everyone, it's different, but for me, um, when I've had a practitioner say that they believe that whatever it is they're doing is um, can cure me of cancer, that actually for me is a bit of a red flag. Um, I'm looking for a practitioner to tell me that they can help me with my side effects or that they can help me mentally, spiritually, etc. But I find that like at the end of that 10 or 15 minute conversation, I know whether or not I want to work with that person. And so really, um, in addition to all the web resources, really just you know ask for that time to get to know that person. Ask them why they're in this field. Ask them why do you want to work with cancer patients. And if they're not willing to make that time to get to know you or answer your questions, I personally don't think they're the right person to be working with. Yes. As far as the um, exercise, looking for exercise classes, um, there are different organizations that do have appropriate um, exercise classes, but I think that the we're really lacking in that, and I think that that's an area of growth, and that's an area that I'm hoping to expand. Um, so um, don't hesitate to at least do physical therapy first if you want to know how to exercise and what's safe. Um, because again, we can help guide you and build you up. I think a lot of people are scared. They don't know what to do, so they don't do anything. Um, so as you're going through treatments, we can help guide you on what's safe to do. Um, and that goes for years after um, treatments are over. So there's a lot of things that continue to persist with people with chemotherapy-induced neuropathy um, and some of the other joint issues that you'll have with estrogen inhibitors. And so we need to make sure that 
Um, you're continuing to use us. We're here as part of the medical system. And again, all medical um, cancer centers um, should have an oncology, have oncology physical therapists and occupational therapists and speech therapists. Um, so just um, use those resources as well. I've had meds for almost nine years. In May, it'll be nine years. And for seven of those years, I've been participating in a program at the Claremont Club, which I realize is very far from here. But if anyone is in that area, it's a free program, Living While well After Cancer. And there's a new documentary that they've made that they um, use me talking about my experience there called Exercise as Medicine. Um, and they interview several doctors and health people saying they really should start covering it by health insurance because it is proven to help a lot of conditions. And I can tell you, I was in pain when I started this program and I don't have pain anymore. And I, don't, I can't swear that it's that, I do other things. Um, but it really has gone a long way to changing who I am. Um, just an acceptance of my physical condition and changing that a little bit and giving me a little bit, even an illusion of power over this disease. Um, it really, I recommend it highly, get off the couch, go for a walk, just a little walk. Do three minutes if that's all you feel like you can do. And maybe tomorrow you do four. Um, that exercise is, a, is proven to help with uh, cancer-related fatigue, so it almost it doesn't seem um, like that should be the answer, but it actually is, and there's a lot of research showing that. So if you're struggling with fatigue, you might need to get into some kind of guided exercise program. Do you have more questions? No. Do you want to know? Well, no. No? Okay. Yes, go ahead, Linda. You have the last word. Yeah. Nothing unlike my last word, you may shoot me down. No, no. I wanted to talk a little bit about medical cannabis. Um, don't be afraid of it. There is a new thing called CBDs. Um, that does not get you high. And it comes in all kinds of different forms now. It comes in candies and pills, and now a patch that you can wear. You don't get high from it, but it does have anti-inflammatory properties, and it's supposed to just give you a feeling of well-being. It also comes in a vape, um, which does not require any matches or anything like that. I don't recommend smoking for us, obviously, but there's a lot of other ways. Don't be afraid of it. You cannot get a prescription from your regular doctor. You have to go to a special doctor and you get a form called a recommendation. And then you go to a dispensary to buy it. And if anybody wants more information, I am Linda the Plant Lady at gmail.com. So email me and I'll help. I was going to ask you the question because I was listening all the the last hour to see if you're going to say something. Um, I, I want to thank all of these panelists um, for, for their time, for their, their passion about the subject. I want to thank Dr. Berger for leading us in a laughing. Uh,